Good afternoon on the East Coast. Good morning still where I am located in my time zone, central time zone, and good morning on the West Coast. And good day wherever else you are, wherever you are in the world. We are the .NET Docs. Uh, Dave, Cam, and Scott. This week, Dave is taking the week off, and we have a guest with us. We're starting a new segment we're calling the Doc of the Week, where we will get uh, somebody in to talk about an interesting uh, document somewhere in the Microsoft Docs, whether it's um, you know .NET, Azure, uh, M365, whatever, and uh, and we're going to feature their documents and their technology and share that with our viewers. Um, uh, so, uh, without any further ado, I would like to welcome Luis from uh, f- from one of our coworkers here at Microsoft, who works with ML.net. Hi, Luis. Hey, folks. Thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, really uh, excited to be here and, and chat with you folks as well as you know any any of our viewers um, about ML.net and the cool stuff that's happening there. Um, as you mentioned, I work on ML.net, but in addition to that, I also work on the Azure machine learning docs as well. So, you know, just being able to sort of straddle both the AI and the .NET space, uh, it's, it's, it's a really, really neat space to be in. Cool, cool. So, ML.NET, I, you know, I, I, I was really looking forward to our, our episode this week because I have to be honest, I am just like a web and Azure guy and I'm just kind of heads down in my ASP.NET world and my, my, my Azure world. And I do a lot of IoT too. IoT is like my big, my big hobby. Um, ML is something that I, I've never touched. And, and to be honest, when I look at it, it's, it's scary and confusing to me. And I'm, I'm hoping, Luis, that you can kind of give me the lay of the land and like where you know where I should get started and what I should what I should start learning as I as I figure out ML. I I would yeah. stop you there, Cam, and say I'm in the same boat. So I've always uh, sort of. Uh, uh, thought of myself as a web developer. And when I hear folks talk about machine learning, I think, well, I need a doctorate to understand that, right? So I'm hoping you can dispel that myth and show us just how easy it is to jump into machine learning with .NET. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, you're spot on for individuals who are starting out and who, you know, don't necessarily know uh, what resources and, and, and where to go, um, especially in the .NET community, right? It can definitely be a challenge. Uh, a lot of the resources that are out there are typically in Python and R. Um, so as a .NET developer, if you want to do machine learning, not only do you have to overcome the hurdle of understanding the concepts, but then you also have, you know, the challenges of, well, okay, fine, now I understand the concept, but, you know, how could I do this within my, you know, ASP.NET applications? Um, so that's really, you know, one of the areas where ML.NET provides value to you, right? Where it's, you can have your full stack in .NET, build your machine learning applications in .NET, um, and, and sort of leverage the same skills and the same sort of patterns and practices that you learned as a software developer within the .NET ecosystem. Um, and, and sort of now transfer them to, to sort of a new domain. So, yeah. So Dave um, is on the stream. Uh, he's he's in, in the chat, even though he's he's not on the stream with us. He asked a great question that that uh, that I'd like to know the answer to. Luis is what what's the difference between ML.NET and the Cognitive Service Services.NET SDK? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's there's quite a few, but um, one way that I like to think about it is sort of a spectrum. Um, and, and, and it's sort, sort of blurry to a certain extent. Um, so cognitive services, it's, it's, it's all fully managed. It's all sort of pre-built machine learning models, um, that you don't have to know much about, uh, to get started in terms of machine learning. All you have to know is what do you want to do? So for example, if you're doing something like, uh, say, uh, entity recognition in text, right? It's trying to figure out, you know, um, are there any sort of celebrities that are mentioned in this text? Are there any companies that are mentioned in this piece of text? Um, you don't have to know all the internals. You can just ping uh, or, or send a request to a, to a REST API, um, and you'll get a response. You'll get sort of what you're expecting, which is, you know, um, a, a list of, for example, all the companies and all the famous names or just all the names that are that are uh, mentioned in a piece of text. Um, you can do the same thing with images. You know, can you recognize celebrities and images and stuff like that? So that's this one of the, of the spectrum where it's all built, pre-built. It's all managed for you. And you, all you have to do or all you have to know is how to make a request to the REST API. 
Um, ML.net sort of sort of tra goes to the other extreme of that spectrum where um, you have the ability to sort of build your own models with your own data. Um, and that's not to say that you can't do that with, with, um, with uh, cognitive services, right? So things like custom vision um, and other custom services where you can provide your own data and train your own models with cost, uh, cognitive services. With ML.net, you have full control over how you're building that model from the data all the way to the algorithms and the transformations on the data that you will be performing. Um, so, yep. so, so let me ask you real quick, though. Mm -hmm. the, the, the cognitive services SDK, the, now that has a cloud dependency, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Yep. Okay. And that's, yeah, that's exactly, that's, that's another, you know, if you, if you want to think of it in other dimensions, right? Um, with ML.net, you can pretty much do all of your training locally. Um, so now, whether that's because you're just playing, you know, you, you're just playing with, uh, with a particular model, or perhaps you have sensitive data, perhaps in an enterprise environment, you know, uh, you may not necessarily be able to upload data to the cloud. You always have the, you know, sort of the, the, the ability to do this all locally. Um, yeah, so, so that's definitely, you know, another, another way to think about it. That being said, though, you can definitely, if you need more power, we just recently introduced with Model Builder, which we'll be talking about later, um, the ability to train uh, image classification models. So uh, on Azure, right? So if you need to scale, um, you can do that as well uh, if needed, um, right? So, so I would say those are probably some of the main differences. And, and like I said, it gets a little bit tricky because with with some of the tooling and additional APIs that I'll also be mentioning, AutoML, that sort of wraps the ML.net, that allows you to sort of straddle in between where you don't necessarily need to know exactly what type of transformations or what type of algorithms you want to um, basically uh, use to train a model. Um, AutoML, what that does is it's, uh, it's an API which basically does exactly what it sounds like. It automates a lot of those steps and all you need to do is provide the data and tell it, hey, am I trying to predict the number or am I trying to predict the categories? What, what exactly am I trying to do? And AutoML will go ahead and figure out for you, uh, you know, what the best algorithm is for your data. So that sort of sits like right in between that spectrum that I was talking initially about between sort of managed and pre-built and cus completely customly built. Okay. Now, so you've got some docs to show us, right? Absolutely. Yep. Another question that I commonly hear, and that question is, what um, what is the relationship between machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence? Yeah, so so that's um, you, one way to think about them is uh, as a subset of one another. So artificial intelligence, you can think of it uh, sort of as the overall umbrella uh, term, right? And artificial intelligence is really um, basically any task that um, a user might normally do, uh, but it's just automated, right? So you uh, you delegate or you offset that particular task to some sort of agent, right? So that could be as simple as uh, sort of uh, spam detection, right? And, and sort of um, creating a rule, rules-based system Right. So traditionally, actually, machine learning and AI, that's that's originally in back in the 50s. That's kind of how it started. It started as rule based systems. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, after some time, like there's only so many rules and so many sort of conditions that you can set uh, where it becomes sort of unruly and unmanageable to sort of uh, basically code the entire environment that you're trying to sort of mimic. So um, then that's where machine learning comes in where instead of you providing the rules and telling the computer or the agent, hey, you know, if this happens, do that, uh, you use statistics and you use math uh, to try to find patterns from within the data and using different algorithms, uh, you can then, instead of telling the computer what to do, the computer learns the patterns and the rules uh, of, of, of your data and sort of your environment, and then it can intelligently sort of make uh, predictions or take actions based on what it's learned. So you mentioned something there that I think would scare a lot of folks away, and that is knowledge of math. Uh, so for me, you know, I, I took a lot of math through school, yep. didn't particularly enjoy some of it. Would you say that a strong uh, 
I guess passion for math is a prerequisite for being successful with something like ML.net. Certainly not. Uh, it's definitely not a prerequisite. Um, and again, some of the tooling that's been built and things like AutoML um, sort of take that um, sort of burden or that challenge. If you if you know perhaps you don't necessarily uh, you're not necessarily comfortable in the topic, um, those things sort of make it less challenging for you to uh, be introduced and sort of to actually get stuff up and running with with machine learning and ML.net. Cool. I'd say let's yeah. jump into the docs and awesome. see what you got. And this yeah, time we sure. can do it without losing audio. We, we we lost audio for just a second in there when I switched over to uh, to the document feed. And I, I, I mean to the screen share feed. I know what's causing that. These first few episodes are going to be a little rough, but yep. this content, this this right here, Lewis, I'm I'm already I've already learned a lot. So hopefully you'll you'll uh, you'll keep this up and, and I won't I won't uh, step over you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, you know, if you folks have questions or if there folks in the chat have questions, you know, uh, please feel free to, to let me know and I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer those. Um, so, yes, this being the .NET Docs channel, um, you know, we, you know, definitely have to talk about Docs. Um, so this here is the .NET Docs or the machine learning ML.NET Docs. Um, I'll go ahead and paste the link into the chat. Um, and what you'll notice is that this is still part of sort of the .NET documentations. Uh, and again, because .NET, although it's in, within the machine learning space, uh, at the end of the day, it's still .NET, right? So it, it sort of, it's still part of the same .NET family. Hey, Luis, uh, could, could yep. you switch to the light theme real quick, just for visibility? Uh, I can, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we have a request in the chat for that. Gotcha. Does that help? And it certainly does. Is this okay, or would you folks like me to zoom in? I, I, I think it should be fine there. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, so going back again, it's part of the .NET family, um, and this is basically it. So as soon as you go, come into the ML.NET documentation, this is kind of what you're going to encounter, and you're going to see that there's different sections. Um, so in the overview, it's kind of what it sounds like. We have two different ways that I'll kind of talk through um, as we go along later on in this stream. Um, so one of the ways the, the way that I was mentioning before, where you have full control over which algorithms you want to use and over um, you know which data transformations you want to apply to your data, uh, that would be the API right here. Um, and again, that's just you know .NET, you're coding in Visual Studio or in any other environment, um, and, and you're using the API to do that. Um, and then we also have tooling available, which uh, is Model Builder and the uh, CLI. So for folks that are using Visual Studio, uh, they can use Model Builder, which is built right into Visual Studio. It's an extent, well, it's an extension, um, and they can just add machine learning or intelligence to their applications with Model Builder. Um, and again, because it's Visual Studio, it's uh, only for Windows at the moment. Um, but for folks who are, you know, perhaps, um, you know, wanting to use it on on Unix or Linux or Mac environments. Right, they can definitely take advantage of the CLI, and for the most part, the the parity in terms of scenarios, uh, it's still the same. Um, so you mentioned Visual Studio and Windows. Uh, mm -hmm. What about for folks who want to use VS Code? Is there any kind of extension that they could use uh, there? You know, uh, so officially, no. Uh, in ter in terms of a graphical user interface, no, um, there is not. However. Um, I did have seen that a community member uh, built something for VS Code. Again, it's not official, um, but it leverages the CLI on, and, and again, the CLI runs on Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux. Um, it, it leverages the CLI to basically add uh, user interface or graphical user interface components into VS Code. So it feels very much like a model builder-like experience, um, but it's not, again, it's not the official sort of, the officially supported uh, tooling. But Again, you know, we we certainly welcome folks to use it if that's something that they prefer. Um, and yeah, so um, yeah, so so in the overview, we basically again we have that uh, for tutorials. Again, same thing. We have uh, our API and model builder. Um, and the tutorials, you can think of them more as sort of like end-to-end -end scenarios where you have your data and we take you through how to build, um, you know, a, a machine learning application uh, to do different things, right? So if you want to predict the prices of taxi fares, you can go ahead and do that. Um, if you want to classify images, uh, we also have the ability to do that. If you want to sort of 
uh, use object detection and deep learning, which is um, sort of going into what you asked before, Scott, what's the difference between you know, AI and machine learning. Uh, now you have deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. So it's sort of like all nested within each other. Um, ML.NET provides that sort of extensibility with and with other deep learning frameworks like uh, uh, the Open Neural ne Network Exchange or Onyx, uh, as well as TensorFlow. So, and for folks that want to see that relationship, uh, you know, you had just mentioned deep learning. Is there something in our docs that kind of break that down for folks so they understand yeah. that deep learning is a subset? Absolutely. So the folks at the Azure Machine Learning docs, as well as with some of our uh, uh, cloud developer advocates have come together with this um, sort of uh, overview, right? And it's called deep learning versus machine learning. And I can paste that into the chat. I'm glad you showed this because that's personally, that's exactly what I was looking for. Some yeah. kind of a diagram that depicts the relationship between those things. Yep, exactly. And, and this is, ex you know, this will tell you exactly what I just mentioned uh, and in a much more visual and probably more concise manner, which is they're all just subsets of each other. Um, and, and again, here are the descriptions. So if, if you folks have, you know, questions and stuff like that, this is definitely a really great place to, to sort of reference. Uh, and again, this is part of our docs, except that now this is, you're in sort of the Azure docs, but we're all the same family. So uh, another question I have for you. So yeah. ML.net, um, you know, this is something that we only began to hear about, I'd say, a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. uh, how did this thing come about? And is it really only like a year old? Yeah, exactly. So that's great that you mentioned that because I didn't do the whole introduction. I kind of just jumped into it. Um, so let, let me take a step back there. Um, so ML.NET, actually, it's, you know, it, based on what I mentioned before that you can use the CLI on Linux, Mac, and Windows, uh, it's open source. Right. Uh, so the project is actually available here on GitHub. Right. Uh, so if folks would like to look at the source code, contribute, uh, they're more than welcome to go ahead and, and go to the machine learning repo. Um, so it's open source. It's uh, built on cross platform. So again, Mac, Windows, Linux. Uh, it's built on .NET standard. So again, you get that sort of, you know, if, if you're on .NET framework, as long as you know you're on the version of .NET Framework that is supported by .NET Standard, you know you can definitely take advantage of this. Uh, and with .NET Core, of course, you can you can also take advantage of it. Um, in terms of yes, you you are correct. So it was not it wasn't until last build that it was that version 1.0 uh, sort of was announced, right? Um, it actually became open source two years ago. I think it built 2018 at the build conference 2018. Um, however, uh, open source is the open source piece is just a very small part of the ML.NET history. So this used to be called uh, TLC internally within Microsoft uh, or the learning code. And it had a lot of the same functionality, except that, again, it was used internally for the past, you know, eight to 10 years uh, inside of Bing. So uh, I'm not sure if some folks who, who use Office, they may be familiar when, when they're using PowerPoint. They're sort of these suggestions. Um, for you know, uh, for slides, right? Uh, like how how can you make your slides better? So a lot of those uh, are powered or were powered by uh, TLC. Um, so so it's definitely being in production again within within Microsoft. Uh, and what was that acronym? It's uh, TLC or the Learning Code. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yep. Yep, Not to be code. confused with the popular '90s group Tboz, uh, Left <laughs> yes. Eye, and Chili. <laughs> Absolutely. Or or what used to be the learning channel. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, a lot of um but yeah, no, this this one uh it's definitely it was definitely better than, than some of those. Um but uh yeah, so certainly uh ML.net uh traditionally has had a long history. Again, the open source piece is is fairly new, but in terms of you know, all the it, it brings all of the learnings and all the things that TLC had sort of done right. Uh, it sort of brought them forward into just now in an open source uh, sort of package and, and framework. Um, and and the other thing that I also didn't really mention was uh, the extensibility of it, which I kind of alluded to before. So it's not just a library; it's more of a framework where you can sort of plug plug in things. Uh, from, from other frameworks. So you have Onyx or the Open Neural Network Exchange. 
And what Onyx is, is sort of, it was, it was a joint effort, I think, originally started by Microsoft and, and Facebook. Um, and the goal was basically to sort of create a standard for uh, machine learning and, and deep learning models. So uh, a lot of folks that, that, that work in machine learning, they might be familiar with uh, uh, libraries like Scikit-Learn or with uh, PyTorch or, or TensorFlow. And what Onyx does is it allows you to basically take a model that you train in one of the supportive frameworks, convert it into Onyx, and then you can consume it from any other framework that also supports Onyx. So in the case of PyTorch uh, and, uh, so for example, TensorFlow, you can have a model, convert it to Onyx, and because ML.NET supports uh, consuming or uh, using Onyx models, you can go ahead and uh, basically use the Onyx model from within ML.NET, even though the model itself was not built in ML.NET. Um, and there's also, uh, there's also, again, the accessibility with TensorFlow, right? So some of the folks uh, from the community, uh, they built this really cool library. Uh, so TensorFlow.net. Um, and what TensorFlow.net is, is basically this uh, a library of uh, bindings for C Sharp. So TensorFlow bindings for C Sharp. So now folks who want to use TensorFlow from within C Sharp, they can use TensorFlow.net. Now, where does this come in in, in regards to ML.net is ML.net takes a dependency on this community uh, uh, built package and, or library. Um, in order to allow uh, training in TensorFlow and uh, to basically consume models in TensorFlow. So, again, the, the, the framework itself, it's, it's fairly extensible. Uh, you mentioned this is a package. Is this a NuGet package or NPM? Uh, or it, is, it is a NuGet package, absolutely. So, if you were to go to NuGet.org um, and you look for TensorFlow, there it is. Very cool. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, doke. So um, let's see. Yep. So going back to the documentation. Uh, yeah. So that's sort of, sort of the spiel and introduction to what ML.NET is, the things that you can do, and 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 all that. Um, again, the tutorials are more end-to-end -end scenarios. Uh, concepts are more again, if you're looking to sort of, for example, understand like you know what type of algorithms are real from within ML inside of ML.NET. Um, you can definitely take a look at those. Um, the how-to guides are a little bit more piecemeal. If you're looking to do one specific thing, so let's say, for example, that in the tutorial, you learn how to build a, a, a sentiment analysis model. Um, so you can basically, you know, if you wanted to know, okay, well, that's fine, but how can I go ahead and deploy it? Um, this is one way that you can use the how-tos, basically to have sort of these piecemeal sort of self-contained uh, uh, instructional guides in terms of how to do specific functions from within the framework. Um, and then if you're, you know, once you're very comfortable with it, you can definitely go ahead and uh, explore the API, right? So the, and here you can browse through our API browser that where along with ML.net, you also have the rest of the APIs in here. So I'm going to uh, jump in and ask you another mm -hmm. uh, newbie question. So you mentioned sentiment analysis. I know I can do that with cognitive services. Mm -hmm. Sounds like I can now also do that with ML.net. So mm -hmm. for folks who have that use case and want to do something with sentiment analysis, what should be the deciding factor as to which one they would use, cognitive services or ML.net? Is it just as simple as uh, do you want a cloud dependency or not, or is there more to it than that? Certainly, that's one of the considerations, right? Uh, and and it also to think about with cloud, right? You have to think about cost. So, um, like one way or another, you're going to pay for it, whether it's you're hosting this model in some sort of service like Azure Functions or uh, a web API, um, or you just want to make a call to the um, you just want to make a call to the REST API or, or the SDK for cognitive services. Uh, so those are some considerations. The more important consideration, though, would be, do I want to use my own data? Um, and if you want to use your own data uh, that is custom to perhaps a specific domain. So, for example, inside of Microsoft, we have all these, and I'm sure it's the same case for any other industry, right? Uh, there's all these acronyms and there's all these uh, sort of um, very domain-specific words or, or phrases um, that perhaps something like cognitive services may not necessarily be fine-tuned to do. Like cognitive services will, for the most part, uh, 
in a general domain be very good at, at what it does, but in more specific scenarios, perhaps um, it may be it may find uh, it may have a, a harder time understanding what uh, to disambiguate what these specific phrases or words mean within your specific context. Um, and in that case, you may want to sort of consider, you know, perhaps training your own model using ML.NET. And of course, if you're in the dot, using a .NET stack, uh, that's definitely another consideration, right, where you're able to keep your entire stack in .NET. Thank you for that explanation. Um, so another question I had for you, mm -hmm. you showed the tutorials in the docs. And one thing I was wondering when I saw that is, um, are there also uh, interactive tutorials, say, on the Microsoft Learn platform? You know, unfortunately, not at the moment. Uh, there there aren't any, but I know, uh, I believe some folks uh, do, may have some plural site ones, if, if that's something that you um, might be willing to explore. Uh, I think those might be available, but on the Learn platform itself, there aren't any at the moment. Uh, but there's definitely plans to you know, get some content up there and, and, and make it easier for folks to sort of go through a more in-depth uh, sort of guided experience that sort of covers everything end-to-end -end, or at least the important parts of ML.NET end-to-end uh, that's a little bit more guided than, say, for example, the, the tutorials inside of our documentation. Very cool. Um, anything else that you wanted to show us in the docs? Yeah, uh, so that's pretty much it in terms of browsing through our docs and if I was a user, how you would navigate the docs. Um, now, of course, we are always welcome. Uh, we always welcome contribution contributions and we we want folks to sort of, um, you know, provide feedback, even if it's, you know, uh, a spelling, um, fixing a, a typo or spelling mistake. We always welcome those things. We also welcome, um, you know, suggestions in terms of what are things that you feel is missing and what are some gaps in our documentation. Um, and you can do all of that, right, all from in here, providing feedback, right, uh, inside of the documents themselves. But if you would also prefer to uh, go ahead and either make the changes yourself, as you folks have been sort of demoing the past few streams, um, you can do that as well from inside of uh, the .NET docs repo. So again, although ML.NET is sort of there's an AI focus at the end of the day, it's still uh, part of the .NET, .NET sort of ecosystem and, and the .NET docs. So um, I'll just take this opportunity real quick to uh, remind our viewers, we have, we have had several new viewers join us that uh, we're here with Luis this week talking about ML.NET. Um, starting with documentation. Uh, now, Luis, uh, do you have uh, where where in, uh, again? So Scott and I both have, have said that neither of us know anything about ML.net. Mm -hmm. um, so we come to the docs. You've given us the tour of the docs. Where would you prefer? Like we start as like brand new ML.net people. Yeah. So one of the places that you can start is definitely our .net page. Whoops, wrong one. <laughs> our .net page, uh, and there's. To get started uh, piece, right? And you can kind of follow this tutorial to kind of go um, through this, the processes of building a, a machine learning app. Um, so you can certainly do that. Um, I will say that probably one of the easiest ways to get started, however, is with Model Builder. So again, Model Builder, <clears throat> it's this uh, graphical user interface built into um, Visual Studio that allows you to basically um, go ahead and build machine learning models into your applications. So um, what I could do now is actually show you one of the samples um, and, and how to go about building a model um, for, uh, for a web application, That'd be a awesome. Razor Pages application. Before yeah. you do that, I actually have a question mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. model builder interface that you're showing us. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume in Visual Studio, there's a particular workload that has to be installed so that you have this capability. Mm -hmm. um, do you know offhand what workload that is? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, there is no workload uh, that is available. It's uh, sort of a separate extension, and I can paste the link in into the chat. So from the Visual Studio Marketplace, you basically download the extension. You can also, you know, do it from within Visual Studio uh, and install it from within Visual Studio. Um, it is compatible with 2017 and 2019. So, you know, if you're still in 2017, you, you can still take advantage of, of using this uh, extension. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's not built in or it's not a workload. Uh, it's sort of a separate extension. Uh, and part of that is that it's still sort of in preview. This was, this has been around for, uh, you know, a fairly fairly short time, so. 
yeah, as you can see, 2018. Okay. Yeah, you had yep. mentioned the extension earlier. I was just wondering mm -hmm. if there were any other components that were needed to support that. Nope, that's it. Just install this extension from the marketplace or from within Visual Studio, and you're ready to go. Nothing else needed other than, of course, uh, uh, well, not necessarily .NET Core, but you know, if, as long as you have the .NET SDK, which, again, they come with, with Visual Studio usually, uh, you should be good to go. Okay. Uh, Is there a minimum version of the .NET Core SDK that would be needed? .NET Core, um, yes. For, so for .NET Core, I think anything above 2.1. Uh, so the last, okay. uh, you know, long-term support version. So yeah, um, yeah, which hopefully customers are already using because of the LTS. Support. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. So two point one, um, and as long as you're in two point one or above, uh, you should be able to to use it. Um, and if you do run into any issues, though, uh, this too is somewhat open source, or at least being able to file issues. Uh, I'll paste the link in here. So if you have issues, again, you're more than welcome to raise them, and, and you know, the team will take a look at those as well if you if you run into any issues. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at what it looks with adding uh, sort of machine learning to a Razor page looks like. So, so for the folks in chat, is the dark theme in Visual Studio okay? I know uh, with Docs, we wanted the light theme. Yep. Uh, Let me see. Yeah, I can never remember where it is. It's like edit preferences, I think. Yeah, this is a good user story in terms of, oh, probably not. Oh, options. tools options. Nope, there. there we go. Another Another uh, pro tip, up in that search bar, control Q, you can search for color theme there. Uh, so, you know, that, that is always the feature that I'm always forgetting, and I, 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 I wish I wouldn't, because that is, the, that is the feature to end all features in Visual Studio. <laughs> the, 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 the search, right? So uh, I, I think it is, is easily one of the most uh, underused features in VS. All right, let's see. Let's zoom here. Um, okay, uh, is the zoom okay on the code? I can see the 100, 175. Okay, it's a 120, but... So yeah, let me get rid of this here. David is saying he can see that, so okay, I'd say we're good. All right, so let me run this app to kind of show you what it does, and then I'll kind of walk you through the code. So... You can imagine you have some sort of, uh, you know, after you you place a call to customer service or, you know, you are leaving some sort of review um, on, on sort of like an e-commerce website. Um, so what this app does is basically it captures some user input text um, and then it tells you whether the sentiment is positive or negative or toxic, not toxic. So, again, you can imagine... As I mentioned, at the end of a survey, they're like, you know, give us your feedback. And you can say, I don't know, model builder is cool. And it will tell you this is not toxic, or you can do something like this, this is not good, and it's bad, right? So fairly simple application. It's built uh, using Razor Pages. Um, so how do you go about adding this intelligence to it, right? Because if you didn't have ML doing it, all you would have what you would have to do is, again, go back to that sort of rules-based, um, you know, system where you would be like, if, you know, the word good is in it, then it's positive. And if, you know, bad is in it, then it's negative. And you have to set up all these rules, right? So, but with machine learning, what you're able to do is you don't tell it what which words to focus on or what things, you know, what, what the rules are. You just feed it a bunch of data that's labeled with positive uh, sentiment. You train your model and you basically, uh, you know, get sort of intelligence into your application. So now that you kind of saw what the app does, let me kind of walk you through the code. So assuming that you have installed Model Builder into, um, you know, in Visual Studio, all you have to do, this is my uh, Razor Pages project. You just right click the project that you want to add intelligence to. Uh, and then you go to add, just like you would for a class or any other type of uh, sort of file into your, your solution. Uh, and you click on machine learning and let me, there you go. So you right click your project, 
you click add and then you click on machine learning. From within this space, you're first presented with a scenario scheme, like what exactly is it that you're trying to do? Uh, so you have uh, the option to select uh, image recommendation is actually fairly new um, and image classification uh, has been around, but the new piece to this is that you can do it in Azure. Um, so in this particular scenario, we want to add sentiment analysis to our project. So I will go ahead and say I want sentiment analysis. Uh, then it tells you to, uh, you, you know, basically um, provide your data. So in this case, you have two options. You can either do uh, from do it from a file or from SQL Server directly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a file, and I go to my data sets, and so, so, so this is the this is essentially the the data that we're using to train the model. That is correct. Yes, this is the data that you're using to train. So again, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you're going to basically have data that is already labeled. So this is what's called uh, in machine learning supervised learning, where you have data where you already know what the outcome is supposed to be, right? Um, and because because you know that what the outcome is supposed to be, when it's just training, what it does is it tries to optimize and find, you know, what is the best way to figure out how to predict what the expected outcome is. Um, yeah. So. so Yep, so ahead. so so the sentiment column there, um, the only two column, the only two values in that column are going to be zero and one. Mm -hmm. That is correct. For yes, essentially positive and negative, right? Yep, exactly. That is exactly correct. Um, and what you have here is the label, which is a column to predict. Uh, so in machine learning, it's typically called label. Um, and the features are basically what are the inputs that will allow me to learn how to basically map to the output or to predict the label, All right? So here we want to select sentiment because that's what we're trying to predict. Um, and in this case, we only have one column, but you can imagine if you had more than one column, if you were doing another scenario, uh, you'd be able to select which inputs to use to build your machine learning model. Um, but in this case, we're just using the sentiment text uh, sort of um, uh, column here. Uh, after that, we just go on to train. Now. In the training phase, uh, what this does is basically it it, it's, it kind of goes and it, it uses AutoML, which I kind of alluded to before. Uh, and what AutoML will do is you give it some time to train for, and it will try to find the best algorithms uh, based on your data. Um, this is a relatively small file, so depending on how much data you have, you might have to train for longer. Uh, Model Builder, though, by default, sort of uh, uh, based on the file size, it will sort of give you what it thinks you should train for. So this this is um, this is filled in for you automatically. You don't have to do it, but you always have the option, of course, to choose a longer time. So so the, to to clarify here, that, mm -hmm. that time to train that's is that like that, that that's like time spent processing that model is is, is specifically or or is it's, that it's uh, how long do you want to explore? So you can think of it like. Uh, it's searching, right? So, so it's trying to search what the optimal model is, and it's going to try a whole bunch of different, sorry, not model, uh, algorithms. It's going to try to find within 15, in this case, right, within 15 seconds, I'm going to try maybe three, four, however many algorithms, and I'm going to choose whichever one makes the best predictions. So it, it's sort of like, how long are you going to give me to explore the sort of the different algorithms? So if you were to bump that up to 30 seconds, we would expect the quality of the model to improve? That is uh, correct, yes. The longer you train for, then the more mo the more algorithms you're able to explore. Um, and, and it's not only a matter of the algorithm. So the algorithms themselves also have sort of uh, hyper parameters, which are just, um, you know, there are different inputs that don't necessarily have anything to do with your data, but they're more specific to a particular model. So AutoML, in addition to f automating the choosing of which algorithm it's going to select for your data, it also automates the search of the best hyperparameters. So that's why um, if I run this, you might see like several algorithms that show up twice. It's not that you know um, it's wrong in terms of you know uh, uh, you know oh I tried this al this algorithm and then I tried it again. What it did that time is it tried it but with different hyperparameters. 
Is there a uh, certain data set size that is recommended just as a rule of thumb for training uh, or for building your model? Uh, so let's say you feed this only 10 records instead of the 250 some that you gave it. Um, mm-hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is there some uh, rule of thumb I, I could follow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, al- that's always an interesting problem. Um, so typically you'll hear the more data, the better. And generally that will be true because the, the more the, the more examples that it can sort of see, uh, then the, 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 the better it's going to be able to generalize. And if you give it new inputs, like basically like it's kind of seen similar examples to what you show it. So it's going to be able to kind of give you a pretty accurate answer. Um, the problem with that is sometimes data has noise um, and trying to identify that noise uh also becomes a challenge, right? So, so I would say yes. Typically, generally, yes. Try more data. More data is generally available. It, more more data is generally advisable. Um, but also beware that sometimes more data may also introduce more noise. And and you know, although it may say like, hey, we got pretty good results. Um, once you try it out uh, and actually try to make predictions, um, that's not necessarily. It may not necessarily be the case. So, um, in this case, yeah, you're right. It's 150 examples, so it's it's not going to be the best model. Um, but again, if you had your own data set with a lot more examples, that's typically what you want. All right. So, so would it? One more question on on yep. on this before before we go on. So, essentially, what if I'm capturing what you've what you've explained as it's figuring out the the optimal al- algorithm? There, it's essentially doing trial and error is is that uh, yeah and and so that's where metrics come in right so it will uh it will try to evaluate your model using cer- certain metrics and the metrics may vary depending on the type of task so for example you might uh use the r squared metric uh and this is all you know for, for folks on the call on the call and, and viewing um this is on our dots um and it explains the different types of metrics and stuff like that um but essentially uh you have your metrics which depending on the type of um, evaluation metrics. So depending on what you're doing, whether it's binary classification, which is what sentiment analysis is, um, you might look at the accuracy, right? Uh, and you try, it will try to pick what the best model is based on the accuracy or whichever other metric it is that you're optimizing for. Um, so that's kind of how it does. In terms of trial and error, I think that it's, in a certain extent, it kind of is, but AutoML is a little bit smarter than that. So it's not just like, it doesn't necessarily go and do brute force. Like it, to a certain extent, it also has some intelligence in, in how it explores the different algorithms. So it's it's not necessarily like brute force trial and error, but it is to the extent that it will try different uh, parameters and based on the accuracy or whatever metric it is that you're optimizing for, that's how I was going to select which ones at the top are the best. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, <clears throat> well, let's let's move on then. All right, let's. Okay, so now if we do 15 seconds, it's going to train for 15 seconds. Um, and as you can see here, uh, it's trying to find the best accuracy uh, and the best al- display the best accuracy in algorithm. So here. 68% um, accuracy, meaning that in 68% of the cases, it predicted it accurately. Um, and it used this algorithm, average perceptron binary. Um, and I think in this one, it may have just explored one. Let's see, uh, evaluate. Uh, for someone who, again, is new to ML, uh, if yeah. I wanted to read more about that algorithm that it used, where would I go? <clears throat> yeah, so you can go to our documentation um, here, and there's algorithms. And, and there it is. So average perceptron trainer. It is a linear trainer, and you can basically click into that, which will take you to um, our API uh, reference documentation, and you can learn a little bit more about about it here in terms of the algorithm, the details and stuff like that. So that is inside of paste into the chat. Whoops. 
the algorithms uh, concepts document. And again, for the metrics, that's also part of um, our docs as well. Which I'll paste into the chat. Um, okay, so here, if you take a look, it actually explored two different types of models. Now, what you'll see is that the accuracy is the same, but it took less time to train this average perceptron binary. Uh, and there's other metrics that may be better for this average perceptron binary. Therefore, that's kind of how it shows what the best model was. Um, so you also have the ability to try it out, right? So tr true in this case means that it's toxic, right? Rude, you're rude. Uh, which true would map to the ones that we saw in our original data set. Um, and then once you're pretty happy with your model, you can, you can of course, so once you get here, this doesn't mean that you stop, right? Um, if you're not satisfied, so for example, if we talk about accuracy, 68%. Um, is this good? Um, and my answer would be, it depends, right? Uh, it's better than flipping a coin, you know, it's better than 50-50. Um, but it's not, you know, 100% um, or 90% for that matter, for that matter. Um, in this case, you're predicting, you know, the sentiment of some survey results and stuff like that. It's not like a life or death scenario. So 70%, 85%, you might be okay with. Uh, if you're trying to diagnose a disease, you know, 68% is not going to fly. So ask yourself, you know, you would definitely want, in terms of accuracy, you want this number to be closer to one. But within the realm of anything that's below one, what's good, it really depends on the domain and the scenario that you're, you know, that that, that you're sort of building this model for. So the, the I, what what kind of actions can we take then to to improve that accuracy? Would, would, would is I, I'm guessing the, the the it's just a question of more data. Is that yep. is that absolutely you're you're spot on. So more data, train for a longer time. Um, yeah, those the, at least within the model builder space because you're sort of there's few things that you can do to to tweak it within the within the API itself. If you wanted to sort of get down and dirty into the code. Um, then you can do additional things to it. But in generally, if you're using Model Builder, those are the main two things that you might want to do. You might want to train for longer, and you might want to uh, give it more data. So so that model that gets generated, it, now, now, is there a static file artifact that, that yes. gets yep. like shipped with the application then as, as one of the, one of the uh, uh, artifacts of the build? Yep, absolutely. So that's where what the next step is, which is code. And when you choose add projects, so here in this case, I cheated a little bit and showed you what the uh, sort of what the end result was. But when you click on add projects here, essentially what it does is it adds two projects. It adds this you know model, the one with the model suffix, as well as console app. And these are auto generated uh, projects. It's auto generated code that, based on the algorithm that it, that it found, um, you can do several things with these. So. Let's explore these a little bit more in detail. For the generated code, is C sharp the only option there? Or let's say I'm doing F sharp or VB, are those options as well? Yeah, at the moment, uh, it's only C sharp. Okay. Yeah, at the moment, it's only C sharp. Yeah. Um, but again, because it's you know it's it's .NET, if you were using the API directly, you certainly have the option to do VB or uh, F sharp. Um, so, okay, so let's explore this a little bit. So the model suffix here, um, you have that static file that you mentioned, uh, which is called mlmodel.sip. And all this is, it's a serialized version of the model. Um, in addition to that, you need to sort of provide what an input and output schema. So if we were to look at the model input, we can see that there's that sentiment column as well as that sentiment text. Right, and the model input, all it is, is just a, a you can think of it as like a, a you know, DTO that um, just defines you know what the data type is, uh, the name of the column, uh, and so on and so forth. These are sort of uh, their attributes that basically tells it, hey, load the first column, <clears throat> and load the second column. Like the sentiment text is going to be the second column, uh, sentiment is going to be the first column. Um, this is typically only used when you are loading from a file. You don't necessarily need to provide it if you're loading sort of uh, in-memory objects. Um, 
And then what you have is you have this really nice uh, way to consume the model. It's which calls predict. Um, <clears throat> it has a function called predict. Uh, and what it does is it initializes ML context. And what ML context is, is basically the entry point for any uh, sort of ML.NET um, applications. You can think of it it's similar to DB context. It's, it's very similar in that way. Um, and, That's yep. exactly the, the example I had in mind, the mm -hmm. DB context from EF. Yep, that's that's exactly um, you know not not exactly, but it's generally that's a way that you could think about it. Yeah, um, and then all it does is it loads the model, the ML.zip file that was generated. It loads it. It creates so, a so, prediction. Yep. So so it packaged that model up and zipped it up for for it compressed it for storage uh, purposes, and and it's all ready to that model is ready to go, huh? It is. Yep. That's it. It's ready to go. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and you create a prediction engine, which is basically a uh, convenience API that allows you to uh, make predictions, a single prediction, that is. Uh, and here, what you provide is what, what's going to be the schema, what my input's coming in, and what my output is, which in this case, it's the prediction. right? Uh, and you also have score. So score, what, it, what score provides is basically an array of floats, which pr have the probabilities for the classes. Um, so in this case, there was positive and negative. What score will give you is, you know, how, what's the probability that's positive and what's the probability uh, that it's negative? They all sum to one. Um, and essentially the highest probability, that's kind of the class that gets assigned to the prediction here, right? So that's gonna be what the output is for, for our prediction. Uh, and then all you do is you call predict, giving it an input in this case, again, input is a model input, uh, and then you return the result, which is a model output. Um, so that's what the model is. It's basically what the it contains are input and output schemas. It contains the serialized version of the model, and it contains uh, an, a sort of a class, a helper function, that allows us to make a prediction. Uh, and then what the console app does is it just has something that will basically take the first row in our data. It will use that predict uh, function from our consume model class uh, and just output what the prediction is. So if we were to run that real quick, just to kind of show you what it does. Um, there it is, right? So model builder school sentiment is false, meaning that it's positive or not toxic, uh, and the predictor was false. So in this case, it seems to be seems to be working. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's that. Great. That's awesome. You got it working. You have a model. You can make predictions. Excellent. But that's not exactly what you want to do. What you want to do is you want to use it inside of your application. So how exactly do you do that? Well, it's actually fairly simple. We'll start in our old handy dandy uh, starter file, right? And what we do is we configure here in our uh, configure services. Um, there is this uh, sort of this. There's a service that you can provide. So one of the things that I didn't mention is that uh, prediction engine on by itself is not necessarily thread safe. So in multi-threaded uh, applications, it may not be ideal to use it. Um, however, uh, something that is provided is this prediction pool engine. And what prediction pool engine is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's an object pool of prediction engine objects that allows you to sort of use it. It, it allows you to use it inside of your, um, you know, your ASP.NET application. Um, and you can use it again with dependency injection and all sort of the best practices that you would normally use inside of your ASP.NET applications. Um, and here, all we're doing is we're telling it, hey, add a prediction engine pool. Again, referencing the model uh, project, we tell it it's going to be have an input of model input, and it's going to have a model output, and we're going to load it from a file that is defined here by our model path, right? But it's still that same mlmodel.zip file. Uh, once that's done, if we go here to our, whoops, go to our code behind, if we go to our code behind for our index file, which was the the basically what you saw where you had the text box where you can provide your input into, 
Uh, again, all we're doing is we're injecting it like we would any other service, uh, our prediction engine pool. And on get analyze sentiment, all we're doing is we're passing it a text, a piece of text. We're using the prediction engine pool to predict the input, right, which is a model input uh, with sentiment text. Uh, and then we're just returning whether it's toxic or not toxic, right? And that's as easy as it is to consume your wow. model from inside of, of uh, you know, uh, ASP.NET application. And, you know, if you're doing a web API, it's it's exactly the same thing. You're just injecting a service uh, and, and you're consuming the model. Like so, yeah, model. like like scott said earlier i mean if if the if the the loop for for using entity framework is familiar then this loop is familiar because it's, it's the exact same loop absolutely yep yep i noticed so, in the code above you're uh, loading up the zip file uh so when you go to publish this application mm -hmm. is that zip file published by default or is there something you need to do so that it is published so um it is so Sentiment Razor uh, references this ML model uh, project, which by default, uh, if I go and check the properties, by default when this is packaged, uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. There it is. By default, this file is copied to your output directory. So because you're already referencing this ML model, this uh, because you're already referencing the model project, by default, you get it inside of your Sentiment Razor uh, your ASP.NET application. Right. Um, so, so if if you were doing this on your own, you would kind of have to do that, where you would have to either, um, you know, uh, copy it to your output directory, uh, have it inside of your, you know, dub dub root. Although that might get tricky if you don't necessarily want to expose your model uh, to the public. You know, not being people, you don't want people downloading your model uh, if you put it in your sort of your, your public www root uh, directory. Um, or you can split this out into its own separate microservice and just you know make a call to, uh, via HTTP. So that's certainly an option as well. Yeah, um, that that that's certainly, and then that opens up a whole world of uh, of integration possibilities. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I know we might be running short on time, so there's just one other thing that I would like to show you folks, uh, which might be interesting. Um, the folks over at .NET Interactive, this is also an open source project. Basically what this is, is it provides uh, .NET kernels for Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks within the data science and machine learning sort of, uh, um, you know, industry, uh, they're, they're these sort of interactive environments where you can basically uh, uh, write code in, right? And sort of experiment it because machine learning is very experimental. Um, there's a lot of trial and error that takes that takes place. Um, if you were to be doing that within .NET, uh, which is you know compiled, um, you have to compile and try every time. Uh, but in addition to that, it's not very visual. Um, and just to kind of show you what this what this looks like, Jupyter Notebooks. In this case, I've downloaded to to an HTML file. But essentially, what you can do is um, very similar. You use this uh, pound r. Um, sort of denomination to basically download NuGet and install NuGet packages. In this case, we're using M uh, the ML.NET. We're using AutoML, which is what I which is basically what Model Builder and the CLI use. Uh, and we're using this data analysis package, which is very very early preview. But what it does is it provides a data frame, the data frame API, which if you're if you if you're coming from the Python or the R sort of uh, environments, data frame is something that's very familiar with you. At a high level, it's basically just a way to represent data in in sort of uh, you know rows and columns, but it's 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 much more than that. Um, and with .NET and the uh, Data Frame API, we're sort of getting getting a little bit of that uh, in, in .NET. Um, so as I mentioned, you're able to install NuGet packages. Again, you're just like you would in .NET. You you go ahead and uh, you use them. Um, and as you can see, right, there's some sort of visual component here to it. We use the data frame API to load a CSV, which we've downloaded. And when we display that, you can see this really nice display in line with your code, right? Um, you can call uh, different sort of methods uh, on the particular data frame. Uh, description basically tells you um, sort of what the maximum, it gives you descriptive statistics of your data set. Um, you can also do plotting, right? This is using Plotly. 
uh, to to basically add plots to your data. Um, here's a nice map of basically latitude, longitude, and median house values. Uh, you might guess that this is California. Here, that's being mapped, uh, and as you can see, <laughs> Silicon Valley and the LA area. That's kind of where. But you're late for where... a meeting. You're late for a meeting, Louise. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Uh, and um, then, so here's the AutoML piece, right? So in with the AutoML API again, which is basically what gets leveraged by uh, by the CLI and and model builder. This is all you have to do. Again, we start with that ML context, right? Uh, which is the entry point, and then all we do is we tell it, hey, create a regression experiment. In this case, because we're trying to predict house prices and we're trying to predict the number, um, it's it's a regression type problem, right? We're trying to predict a numerical uh, value. And again, we're telling it, hey, train for 15 seconds. Uh, and once we set our experiment, we then go ahead and execute it with our data, and we tell it, hey, predict, predict the median house value. Uh, and it's going to take care of figuring out what the best algorithm is based, you know, using this a lot of time. So, so the interesting point that I, that I, I gathered from from this is mm -hmm. that you, you we can train we can train at runtime. Is, absolutely, is... yes, absolutely. And, gotcha. and again, it's it's all in line. You're able to sort of see everything that's happening. Um, in this case, again, what we did was we plotted um, basically how long it took. And um, sort of the error, right? How many did it get wrong or how far off it was? Uh, and it tried these two algorithms. We can see that um, LightGBM took a longer time, but it was more accurate than SDCA regression. And that's basically what got plotted here. The results visually of, of, of you know, these two axes, basically error and, and training time. Here, we're basically uh, plotting the predictions. Like, this is what... Uh, what the actual value was versus the predicted value. And we can see that overall there was a sort of a, a, the line of best fit. Our data sort of falls along this line. So it's fairly accurate what we predicted. Um, and one last thing, right? Like this uses F sharp. You can use F sharp PowerShell with it. Um, in this case, right, we're using F sharp uh, to, we're using this thing called magic. So you can think of magic kind of like attributes where you place it on top of whatever cell that you're trying to run. Um, and as it's interpreted, it will be like, oh, okay, I see that there's this thing that I need to take into account. In this case, I want to run F sharp inside of a sort of C sharp notebook. Um, so make sure to, you know, use this as sort of like, to, to in order to sort of evaluate whatever code is in here, first take into account that, you know, this is, uh, you know, you need to basically do this first and pass it through this sort of evaluator, if you will. Right. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is this is a really cool project uh, that you know it just it just brings you closer to sort of that workflow that typically takes place inside of sort of like a machine learning and data science uh, in the data science industry. So you know, again, typically a lot of these tools they were uh, mainly uh, within the Python or you know maybe Julia type of environments, but you know now we're we're getting them in .NET. So you know. Do you feel like there's an? Do you feel like if if I if I were a fluent Python developer, which I'm not, but if I were, mm -hmm. um, would there be any? What would be? What would your um, guidance be in terms of of how I go about selecting what types of uh, whether I want to jump on ML.net or some other uh, framework uh, to for my application? I mean, is, is it strictly a language choice, or or is there something else that comes into it? Yeah, so there's certainly no no denying that Python, uh, the Python ecosystem for data science and, and R as well, right? They're a little bit more mature than the .NET ecosystem. Um, that being said, though, you have stuff like ML.NET, uh, .NET Interactive, the one I didn't talk about, which was uh, .NET for Apache Spark, which basically provides bindings for Spark, which is a tool used for big data and data processing. So a lot of the stuff that typically, again, has been in the Python, in the R communities, a lot of that stuff is coming to .NET. So would you, if folks in Python and R have been working within those that ecosystem um, and they're comfortable with it and it works for their for their you know workflows, that's that's great. Um, and probably you're going to find a lot more um, libraries and and packages uh, inside of those uh, ecosystems, right? 
Uh, however, if you are a .NET developer and you want to join in on the fun, right, and you want to do all this stuff that you know everybody, you know everybody seems to be talking about, um, you know you're not sort of forced to transition. Um, you know there may be use cases where you re- you know you can't take advantage uh, of you know where ML.NET you can't necessarily do it or any of these other data like packages and libraries for .NET. Um, but generally, if you're in .NET, a lot of the stuff you can you can kind of do it. Um, so so that's what I would say. It's not necessarily to say you know switch over. It's more of a if your whole stack is in .NET um, and you want to leverage those skills, you know maybe you have an engineers and, and developers who have been working in .NET for years within your company. This is a way for them to continue to le- to continue to leverage their skills. Except now you're just extending it to a new domain, right? Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So um, I look at this a lot like the the Xamarin uh, sales pitch. So if you know C sharp, you can create a, a mobile app. The same is yep. true here. If if you have a machine learning uh, use case to tackle at work, and you know C sharp, well, now we're at a point where you don't have to hop over to a completely different ecosystem, Python, for example, to accomplish that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's spot on. And, and you know, the other benefit with stuff like model builder and the tooling is you're still, you know, in that same environment that you know and love. Uh, and you were, you know, if you're using Jupyter, uh, you know, if that's kind of what works for you and what you've used to work in Python with, uh, and now you want to sort of, you know, still work in .NET, but in a Jupyter like environment, you can use .NET Interactive. So um, there's there's definitely the value there. There. Um, and and you know similar to the Xamarin that you were mentioning, it's not to say that just because you know Xamarin, you can just not know what the individual APIs within each of the platforms does. You still need to know how to do those things. Except now you're just doing it in C sharp. And very similar here, you still need to kind of know like, okay, well, what are these metrics and kind of what are these algorithms? Uh, you need to have like a, a, a sort of a, a cursory knowledge of it. But by no means do you also need to be an expert, and and you can do it all from within. You know, C sharp, F sharp, uh, and VB. Very cool. So I think that probably seems like a good stopping point to me. Um, uh, how about you, Scott? Did you have any other questions for Luis? I agree. I, I guess my big takeaway from what Luis has shared with us today is, you know, machine learning isn't as scary as I thought it was. It's more or less the terminology that you have to learn. If you already have those .NET skills, um, that's the biggest hurdle, in, in my opinion. Uh, learning the terminology is, you know, relatively easy compared to, you know, picking up .NET for the first time and trying to learn that ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly the same takeaway I came uh, away with. Is, is this, this, I was intimidated by, by it before, but this seems, the, thank you, Luis, you really clarified a lot of things, and, and it's, it seems a lot more accessible to me now. Yeah, great. So uh, with that, I, I think that concludes this uh, this week's episode of the .NET Docs. I want to thank you, Luis, for joining us and, and sharing ML.NET and the ML.NET Doc set with us. Uh, uh, viewers, please, you know, by all means, head over to the ML.NET Docs. Check out the uh, Getting Started Guide that uh, Luis pointed out earlier and uh, uh, walk through that kind of uh, introductory sample uh, and uh, see what kind of creations you can come up with. Um, and with that said, uh, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next week.